Good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation with Cal featuring the Arts Launch Preview with Professor Rob Ranzowski and Dr. Stephanie Vasco. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to this afternoon's presentation. My name is Christine Ranke, Senior Director of Advancement for the College of Arts and Letters, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we begin, for those of you who are new to Zoom, I would like to direct you to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You may use the Q&A button to submit the questions you have at any point during the webinar. We will keep track of them and we'll make sure to address them throughout this next hour. I would also like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel within the next few days. If you couldn't make it, or if you wanted to rewatch it, or if you wanted to share it with a friend, we'll make sure that you receive the link. Only the faces that will be shown today and today and on the recorded version are those of the presenters. So you don't need to worry about turning your camera or your microphone off. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today. Professor Rav Raznowski is an award-winning actor, author, director, educator, and playwright. He is a professor at Michigan State University where he serves as the head of acting and directing in the Department of Theater. His publications include books, plays, articles, and chapters. His newest book, The Introverted Actor, Practical Approaches, was published last year. He served as the National Outreach and Education Director for Actors Equity Association. He received a Fulbright Scholar. He received a Fulbright to teach and direct in Greece. And he's received numerous awards for his teaching at MSU. Welcome, Rob. Dr. Stephanie Vasco will also be joining us, and she's currently the Managing Director for the MSU Center for Interdisciplinary. Trained in chemistry and nanotechnology, Dr. Vasco's, Vasco's work now focuses on helping teams improve their communication and their collaboration. She is also an interdisciplinary artist whose work focuses on the intersection of the natural and man-made. Dr. Vasco has previously served as co-chair of the Mayor's Arts and Cultural Commission in Lansing, Michigan. Welcome, Stephanie. I wanted to kick off the conversation today, and Stephanie, if you can share with us, how did Arts Launch take shape? So Christine, you and I met at a brainstorming event for Cal, I think many years ago at this point, and we were discussing the arts event that usually happens um, once a year um, at the Grand Hotel. And we were talking about how that's one, it's a one weekend, um, it's, Sometimes kind of difficult to get up to, right? You've got to take the ferry over to Mackinac Island. Um, but what would happen if we had an event that was on campus? And what would happen if we made an arts event that focused on maybe more than a weekend and was accessible to everyone and allowed alumni to come back to campus for a bit? So you and I started brainstorming about what a weekend like that might look like if we brought it down here to MSU, made it free, opened it up, um, really focused on the different types of individuals we have at MSU working in theater, working in visual arts, um, and giving an opportunity really for students, faculty, staff, and alumni to come together. And then um, the Dean's Arts Advisory Council, which both uh, Rob and I serve on, uh, took up the mantle on making that come to fruition this year. So I wanna turn it over to Rob for um, some extra information about how we moved kind of from this proposal from, with Christine and I to a week long event. Yeah, so the week long event was created um, as a response to the art strategy, MSU art strategy, which is still in um, uh, nascent stages, but it's hopefully picking up some steam. And, and basically that was a strategy that talked about a variety of ways that um, MSU could position itself as an arts leader. Um, and so related to that, one of the ideas was a celebration or a festival of the arts. And so from the Dean's Arts of Advisory Council, we decided to work together to create um, this arts launch, which is that week long event um, with a variety of arts. Let's talk about some of the goals that we hope to accomplish with this arts launch. Stephanie, you want to go? I, I... I'll let you start, Rob. 
Okay. Well, I think one of the big things that I'm excited about is the connection to alum. Um, so in the theater department, we're having um, Andrew Buck come back, who's a voiceover artist and actor, and he will be doing a free workshop on voiceover acting. Um, he's and just really excited for him to meet a whole new round of community members as well as um, students within the department. Yeah. Now I'm looking forward to bringing um, community members from Lansing, East Lansing, the greater mid Michigan area together with alums really building that interest in what the College of Arts and Letters has to offer and the really cool work we're doing I think there's some really interesting panels and hands on workshops and virtual events and all kinds of different ways that people can come and get involved and I'm excited to really see the ways that um, people engage uh, across the week with us. I'm excited too to see how some of the students will engage because this of course isn't just our College of Arts and Letters students, but we really hope to attract students from all across the university. Rob, Stephanie, do you have anything to add with that about how, how this might help um, with the arts launch across MSU? So as you mentioned, Christine, I by training am a chemist and nanotechnologist. A lot of my work focused on um, building semiconductor transistors as a graduate student. The presentation I'm going to give for Arts Launch actually traces the history of the transistor through um, its uh, development to now and how we've used that to both collect sounds from space, but also make sounds that sound like space using synthesizers. So there's a lot of really interesting steam overlap. So when Rob was talking, uh, used the word, uh, said something about ga gaining steam, I was really excited because I was like, oh yes, STEM in the arts. Um, so I think there are a lot of really neat opportunities for students who are interested in STEM fields, but also kind of wanna come over and like check out what we're doing in the arts or like really engage both sides of themselves um, to try out things. There's an Arduino workshop. Um, we're gonna hear in a bit about a DIY synth workshop. So there are a lot of really interesting ways I think students from across campus are gonna be able to participate in the event. Yeah, and I think what's exciting is uh, by pairing with the, uh, this week is the National Education in Arts Week. Um, so I think that this is an important um, aspect, but I think what's where we positioned it as a launch for the season, really what it's about is trying to get newer students to understand where the arts venues are on campus, what is available to them, and the community members as well, plus new faculty that might have come to campus. Um, so it's really about um, reintroducing the arts after such an absence that we've had. Thanks, and I think you hit on one important point too, Rob, that it is connected to National Arts Week. Would you like to expand a little bit more on that? Sure. So um, the National Arts and Education Week is where educators join together in communities across the country to, to tell the story of the impact of the transformative power of the arts in education. And, um, and I don't know if scheduling anything around MSU is uh, difficult around football, um, but what it worked out perfectly that this week did in fact fit at a time when there was not a football game so we could take over a bit more of the campus. So that was, that was one of the reasons as well. And one big key um, takeaway too from that is that we're calling it arts launch for a reason and not just arts week. Stephanie Brown, would you like to talk a little bit more about why Arts Launch versus just Arts Week? We're coming back to campus after, for me, 18 months of being gone. Um, and really, this is an opportunity to kind of launch ourselves back into the fact that MSU, Cal, has such a great diversity of arts opportunities across different fields. Um, even if you're not participating in the formal events during arts launch, it's a way to remind yourself or get familiar with the fact that there is the Broad and there's the Broad Art Lab that offers programs and there's the sculpture garden. There are the sculptures on campuses and there are the different spaces around campus that have different works of art. And to really get ourselves situated, A, to remember kind of the rich culture of art that's at MSU, but B, to also think about that transformative power that art has in our lives for healing and for bringing our creativity to the surface and for really kind of coming back with an energized and renewed spirit. 
Yeah, I think also that that idea in discussion of the Arts Launch Committee, there was a lot of discussion about what should the name be, right? And everybody was like, well, why just a week for the arts? It should every year, the, every day is Arts Day. So then the launch became this idea of launching into the new year, launching to new students, launching that way. And I think that the hope is that this is a can um, this is the inaugural event, but we hope it's an annual event. Thank you. We're working with a lot of people too across campus. Um, would you like to expound a little bit on some who some of our cross collaborative partners at MSU are? Sure, we have people from the College of Education. We have people from um, the dance minor within the department. Um, we have people from um, uh, we're, we're all across the broad MSU museums, um, the library. So we're bringing together a lot of people under the umbrella of the College of Arts and Letters, but we're hoping to expand it so that we have um, a variety of guests. I can share with I can share some of the events. Is this the time to do that or wait a little? Yeah, no, absolutely, Ralph. Go ahead. So this is the Arts Launch website, uh, which was created by the College of Arts and Letters team for uh, during the summer. And basically, here you can see. Um, the three audiences that we talked about, MSU students, community, and alumni. And then here is a list of the events that are happening on campus. Um, some of these are virtual events. Um, we're, we're hoping to make them all, all events as virtual as possible so that people not in the area can attend. Um, but those links will be posted up on here. So you can see that there's a variety of things from rock painting, button making, to interactive events about arts education. This is a dance, uh, dance performance, scenery painting workshop, improv shows, uh, live band, the dangling participles. And so a variety of things happening throughout the week. Most of the, the big, the main Lots of programming are on Saturday and Sunday, but there are movie events and other lecture events that are happening Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And we end sure. with, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rob. I just wanna say that we're ending with most importantly, a free silent disco at Summer Circle Courtyard. <laughs> yeah. If you can explain that a little bit. I know when, I, when you told me about it, I'm like, we're doing a what? And Stephanie and I are like, is that a cool thing? <laughs> and you assured us that it really is. So we're obviously not in touch with it, but can you share <laughs> us what a silent disco is? Sure. So um, a silent disco is where people are wearing their uh, wearing headphones and they are listening to different music and they are dancing in different ways. So they're, they, some people may be dancing really fast and, and, and thrashing and other people over here might be dancing really slow legato that sort of thing so it's a really cool thing to watch um it's it's really popular um students really seem to be into it and we have room for 200 people to come to that silent disco so yeah. oh that'll be fun that'll be fun i know that we have a couple questions from the audience too um, one question is, is what can our audience members expect to see and experience? You shared the website and we'll have a couple of presentations. Is there anything else that we can kind of share as um, a, a little teaser to what will be coming up for that day, that week? Well, I think that what you can expect is as much involvement as you want to. So like Stephanie was mentioning, there's lots of interactive hands-on workshops, right? You can observe those, you can sit back and watch them, um, but it's really kind of getting involved as, as much as you want uh, for across a variety of, of topics and interests. Stephanie, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and share my screen okay. with you all. Um, this is just a little patch I've been working on. We'll be showing some VCV rack in my workshop. So we'll be doing some hands-on building um, synthesizer patches, bringing in some soundscapes, doing some things if the audience wants to come and suggest anything. And we'll be making all kinds of sounds. So it'll be uh, exciting. And um, I think there are a lot of places for audience participation that'll be happening. So I'm really excited for us to A, um, show the ways that the college and the university has really thought about the ways in which we can increase interactivity in an online way throughout the last 18 months. I think we've done a lot of really impressive and great work on that. And I'm excited to share that with the community. And B, um, there's going to be some really cool hands-on, like if you've never got to play with some of these things before, if you've never got to make a print or do a silent disco, there are so many different opportunities throughout the week that I think there's a little, a little something for everyone coming up. Absolutely. I know that we've been talking about a lot of different hands-on things and a lot of theater things. 
what about literature? I know that there's some film there. Um, do you recall, I believe that there might've been a poetry reading at one point? Uh, currently the one that I know about uh, in terms of literature is uh, the What If Wilhelmina um, mm -hmm. event. And that's a, a, a reading of the children's book by the author and illustrator. And it's gonna be uh, the next um, MSU's Sensibility Ensemble. So it'll be a new musical created from this reading um, that will work with neurodiverse audiences. And so um, they're bringing in the author and the composer and the designer to talk about what, how they would um, change this book from book to um, theatrical adaptation. Very neat. Let's talk a little bit about where people are finding this information. What does the marketing look like that we are launching? I know if you're an alum, if you have your email address um, updated with us, you should have received um, an email um, announcing Arts Launch, as well as information on how to attend and the link to the website. Stephanie, can you um, expand a little bit about how we're working with community partners? Yeah, so the Center for Interdisciplinarity um, works pretty often with community partners. We run a transdisciplinary graduate fellowship program that partners with community partners, two teams of three students a year. So we're making sure our community partners from that program know about it. But as the former co-chair for the Mayor's Arts and Culture Commission in Lansing, I'm sending it to all of my fellow commissioners to get out the word and hoping to also talk to some of the local press in Lansing and East Lansing to make sure that um, we're really getting it across on print, social media, email, every way that we can to get the community involved. And that's a great segue to say everyone watching, if you can please share information yeah. about this, um, right? Because it is, it's, it's going to be hopefully become a norm, but we're hoping now to at least begin to introduce people to it so they can expect it for next year. Absolutely. We had another question too. As an alum, how can I get involved in helping to plan a local to plan local East Lansing events for Cal? Is there a way for alumni to participate on campus in on campus art exhibits or current alumni work at the Broad the Union Gallery or other places around campus? I think that's a place where we need to expand. Well, that was our original intent, right? We wanted to have a variety. We wanted people from the community. And then we were just like, that's, it's our first time. We have to, we have to begin <laughs> somewhat smaller. And then I think that that's definitely the goal to, to expand to community presentations alongside students and faculty. I don't know the answers to the last part of that question. That's something I think that we have to explore a little bit more on too. I think that, um, as we're very young in this endeavor, and this is our inaugural event, um, any suggestions and thoughts on how we can improve it for next year and the year after and the year after is really going to be important. And I can probably see down the road too, the um, need to not only have um, our internal committee working on this, our arts launch committee that we have internally within MSU, but also to how that might be able to expand into the community so we can get some thoughts and feedback from the community and also start to launch other partnerships and collaborations in with Arts Launch. Post, I know that post launch, after we go through this whole week of um, our Arts Launch, I think that the YouTube videos will be made available to those that, um, to at least the um, uh, webinars that we have online. We still are working through figuring out how that might look like and if we can go ahead and do some um, broadcasting of in-person events. And I think that we're just starting to um, explore those opportunities and see what that would look like. But we're hoping that as much as we can be live and YouTubeable, if I can use that word or make up a word, um, that we'll definitely go ahead and um, make that available to everybody if they weren't able to participate it, in it at the beginning. We also have another question too on if there has been any discussion um, to reach out to regional alumni clubs to get together for some of the virtual events. That, that's an awesome suggestion. We haven't even thought about that. Um, we're um, doing our best to make sure that we can launch this um, in a couple of weeks and safely and um, securely for everybody who wants to participate. But that is actually um, an, an incredible idea that we need to look into sooner than later. So thank you for that suggestion. Um, 
we have another audience question too that asked um, if we have considered working with the Office of Admissions on some of these activities, it would be a great way to draw students from outside of Michigan as well. And Rabbi and Stephanie, I don't think that that's something that we thought of either. So um, as we start this inaugural year, we really appreciate all of these thoughts and suggestions. Yeah, we had talked about the idea of connecting to um, high schools in the area as master classes, as conduits to um, to letting them know that there is arts on the MSU campus. There are arts on the MSU campus, so that is there. But I think that the admissions part of it is really, really a, a interesting way to think about it. Stephanie, any thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, suggestion. And I'm just, I'm so excited by all the suggestions that are coming in and all the yeah. ways that you all are helping us think through ways that we can strengthen this. I love the idea of the local alumni clubs having sp uh, specific events. And that also makes me think about like, right, building kits. Like, can we, with for some of the workshops, have kits that we send out and have like full interaction from around the country or around the world and then like put that together on the website and say like, hey, send us your pictures, tweet us your pictures, show us what you're making, show us the things you're coming up with and really just build that sense of community together, but from afar. And I think that's what this week is all about is building that sense of community focused on the arts and within MSU and the greater East Lansing region. So with that, I want to thank you both, but I know that you're not going too far at all because we're going to go ahead now and share with you three short previews of what you can expect with Arts Launch. So Stephanie, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Christine. I'd now like to introduce our first Arts Launch presenter, Professor Abhishek Narula. Abhishek is an artist, a hacker, and an educator. His practice-based research explores the complex relationship between technology, society, and culture. His creative work has been shared through exhibitions, publications, and presentations nationally and internationally. In May 2020, he received his MFA from the University of Michigan Stamp School of Art and Design, and he holds his MS and BS in Electrical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please enjoy a preview of his Arts Launch presentation, Circuit Building, DIY Electronic Music Synths. Thank you for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my God, this is gonna be such an awesome week of events. Uh, in fact, you know, every day or every other day I'm going on the website looking at all the other events. So, you know, hopefully everyone will join us. Um, so, um, as Stephanie was saying, I'm just going to quickly share uh, the workshop that I am doing um, for this week. Uh, and so I started actually last year uh, as, a, as a faculty in the Department of Art, Art History and Design. And so it's been sort of a weird year for all of us, and especially for us new faculty, it's been, you know, we're so excited that, you know, we really able to be together in person uh, this fall. And so this is like a perfect, uh, uh, perfect event for, for that. So uh, quickly, just kind of brass tacks here. So uh, our, my workshop is about circuit building, where it's, it's going to be a hands-on experience to basically make uh, music synthesizers. Uh, it is happening on Friday, September 17th, uh, between 5 and 7 p.m. And it will be happening uh, in the Summer Circle Courtyard, which is right outside the art, um, the art building, the Kresge Art Center. Uh, before quickly I, I, I jump right in, I just want to uh, talk about uh, the area that I'm working in. So uh, this event, this workshop is brought to you by Electronic Art and Intermedia, uh, which is a subset uh, within the uh, studio art um, a major in the art department. And uh, we, uh, as Stephanie was talking about uh, a little bit of my practice, there are a few of us that sort of work at the intersection of uh, technology, science, culture, and of course the arts. Uh, we're very much interested at, at this intersection. We're interested at some of the possibilities of this radically interdisciplinary approach of doing art. Um, and of course, uh, it is very experimental in nature. Uh, we do all the things from performances to sound to music to visual art to installations to sculpture, kind of all, uh, kind of all of those things. Um, and so um, uh, that that's what we are. And you know, we we are actually working on a new website for our um, for our little group. And you know, that will also be launched as a part of uh, this event. So more to more to come um, on that later. Um, but let's get to our event that I'm doing. So this is a hands-on workshop. Uh, it's basically, we will learn how to make an electronic synthesizer circuit. Um, and it, 
it's sort of, uh, if you've never made electronics or worked with electronics before, this is perfect for you. Um, we are gonna be making little uh, noisemakers that make these crazy sounds. These are the couple of things that you will learn in, in particular. So obviously making the circuit from scratch, you will learn how to solder. Uh, I will also talk about some base of, of electronics. So if you've ever been interested in you know, using that or getting the exposure to that, this is the, the workshop for you. And of course, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of uh, the history of electronic music. Um, it has quite a, a expanded history and lots of different backgrounds. A lot of different artists have used it in very different ways. And so uh, it'll be a good sort of conversation around that as well. Uh, but most importantly, uh, once we're done making our little doodads, you know, we're going to have a little electronic music jam session. And so uh, hopefully, you know, all of us can sit there and play with our little music uh, instruments and, you know, have an impromptu uh, music performance. In terms of what uh, it will look like, so the actual circuit, the, this little piece of thing that we're going to make, it's called the Atari Punk Console. Uh, this little circuit has been around uh, since, the, since the 80s. And uh, it is sort of the foundation of where electronic music basically comes from. Um, it's a very, very small circuit. It's very easy to build. And we're basically, uh, when you come to this workshop, you will, give, you will be given these sort of electronic components. And our goal is to go from what you see on the left to what you see on the right. So a fully assembled circuit. Um, and uh, you know, I'll walk you through all the process. We'll talk about how to solder things, like I mentioned. We'll talk about different electronic components. We're going to talk about how you know these things actually make uh, sounds and noise. Um, also, you get to keep this, so you will actually walk away with a small uh, instrument as you go home. So um, you know, you'll have something to keep uh, as you uh, once you come to this workshop. In terms of um, what this sort of sounds like. Um, I just want to have a quick YouTube video. So this is not me. This is just another uh, somebody else's um, video about just demoing the circuit. I'm just going to make sure my sound is shared. Perfect. But let me play that. <laughs> So that's essentially our goal. We're going to get a little crazy, going to get experimental, uh, and all that stuff is possible with just this little circuit. Uh, so hopefully, you, hopefully all you will uh, join us uh, for this event. A um, couple of things to mention, there's no experience required. So if you've never done anything with electronics or electronic music or anything like that, do not worry, this, this event is specifically meant for you. Uh, it is also completely free. You don't have to pay for any of the, of the materials or resources. Everything will be provided to once you come to the workshop. The only thing uh, uh, we are requesting is the, that you register so we know how much uh, stuff we need to build, bring to the, to the workshop. Um, and the, uh, the, in our, um, uh, our events uh, page on the Arts Launch website, there's a registration link. So please, please register. Um, and uh, again, it's on Friday, September 17th. Uh, between 5 and 7 p.m. Uh, right in front of the Kresge Art uh, Center. So uh, hopefully you will all will come and I'm very excited to meet all of you in person and make some uh, funky noises together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rob, will you be able to introduce our next guests? Yes, I will. Um, I'm looking forward to your full presentation in September. I would like to now introduce Abigail Palmasano. Abigail is a student in her final year at MSU studying sustainable parks, recreation, and tourism with a double minor in graphic design and environmental science. She is from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and has been practicing digital paintings for the last four years and creating, uh, creating art her whole life. Please enjoy her preview of Women in the Horror Genre. Hi there. Uh, my name is Abigail. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, so my uh, collection that I'm sharing with Arts Launch is kind of just started out as a hobby. Uh, I've loved horror movies pretty much my whole life, and I've loved doing art my whole life. So I kind of just combined the two and started, you know, 
if there was a protagonist that I really liked, I just started drawing them and eventually it came to what we have now. So I'm excited to share 10 pieces with you guys. Uh, it's going to be electronic paintings. So I paint on my iPad and then probably gonna do some sort of webinar or presentation where I'll show all of those. Um, just a little sneak peek. I've done Lady Gaga from American Horror Story. Uh, I've done Danny from Midsummer. Uh, also some classic pieces like Silent, Silence of the Lambs. So I think if you're really into horror, you're really into women's studies, then this would be a really great event for you to come out towards. Um, like I said, this started out as, uh, as a hobby, but as I started completing these pieces, I noticed a theme between all of them that like, most of these protagonists start with trauma in their lives and then that trauma kind of kickstarts the rest of the horror of the movie. So uh, I thought that was really interesting and yeah, I'm really looking forward to Arts Launch and I hope I'll see all of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abigail. That actually really sounds exciting and I'm looking forward to the presentation. I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Chris Frilingos and Dr. Morgan Shipley, who will give us a sneak peek into their arts launch event, Red Pill, The Matrix and Religion. Christopher Lingos is a professor in, of religious studies at Michigan State University. He writes and teaches about biblical literature and early Christianity. He studied at Greensboro College in North Carolina and the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He earned his PhD in religious studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His latest book, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Family Trouble and the Infancy Gospels is an early study of Christian stories about the childhood of Jesus. Morgan Shipley, PhD, is the inaugural Folio Endowed Chair of Spirituality and Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Michigan State University. Dr. Shipley's research, projects, teaching, and work related to the chair focuses on, one, the understanding of mystical and esoteric new religions that highlight spirituality as opposed to institutional religiosity, positioning individuals and groups who, incre who increasingly identify as spiritual but not religious, and three, advancing the secular spirituality as a distinct way of engaging the world by seeking out more inclusive, virtuous, and responsible ways of being together. Chris Morgan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you all virtually for being here with us. Um, since Chris and I are co-presenting together, I'm just going to say a brief introduction, um, set up a little bit around the background and my specific contribution to our presentation, and then Dr. Filingos will jump in here as well and say a little bit about his presentation. Um, so I'm going to share with you just a nice little background slide that we can have up here as we talk. Um, so let me just move this. All right. So um, uh, upon its release in 1999, The Matrix uh, galvanized still ongoing debates about its originality, its messaging, and its impact. From exceedingly new camera tricks to a host of philosophical questions, the film pushed viewers into exciting new areas, but also some very difficult scenarios, um, including, the ways, the ways, including the ways in which the film elevated guns and gratuitous violence and inspired people to be like Neo. Um, this included the Columbine shooters, for example. Um, at its core, however, the Matrix operates through a single choice between pure freedom, albeit in a world of devastation, um, and blissful ignorance. As Neo is challenged by Morpheus, take the red pill and wake up to all the horrors of reality, but with the freedom to act, or take the blue pill, which will let you stay clueless and happy in a simulated dream world. For my co-presenter, Dr. Falingos and myself, it is the film's messaging on religion and the subsequent use of its religious and spiritual symbols that are especially interesting. From the emphasis on a proto-Christ figure, to apocalyptic narratives about the continuation of human existence, to the very question of what constitutes the real real, the matrix forces us into religious consideration and spiritual reflection. For myself, I've become increasingly interested in how the film's apocalyptic themes, emphasis on locating and acting upon true freedom, and the overarching question of what constitutes its reality have all become a common trope within the QAnon conspiracy movement, and broader religiously based conversations regarding the 2020 election, events like January 6th, and increasingly over the last uh, month or so, um, anti-vaccination movements. Just as Neo is challenged to choose between the red and blue pill, between the real real or a life of illusion, 
many Americans find themselves caught within a matrix, see what I did there, uh, of doubt, half-truths, and all-out conspiratorial lies that locate resonance and at least uh, the appearance of legitimacy, the religious doctrines of salvific conduct and millennial thinking. They are saving the world on behalf of all of us. For believers of Q, to take the red pill is to awaken from a condition of slavery imposed by a deep state seeking to, uh, seeking to negate the nativist ideal of America and into a new millennium predicated on individual liberty and commonly white privilege. In my portion of the presentation, we'll explore the implications of this condition and the ways in which swallowing the red pill offers the promise of salvation, but increasingly a worldly condition defined by antagonism and overt violence. So with that little preview of what I will be trying to do with the matrix um, and Q and its connection to specifically millennial thinking within religion, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Chris to say something about his portion of the presentation. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Um, yeah, I can't think of uh, anybody better than uh, Dr. Shipley to um, take us into uh, what's, you know, what are some fascinating, um, fascinating questions, but, but also disturbing ones. Um, my uh, portion is uh, going to be um, historical. Um, so uh, like, like Dr. Shipley, I teach in the Department of Religious Studies. Um, our fields are quite different. Uh, my teaching and my research uh, is focused um, mostly on the early Christian era. So the um, centuries following um, the death of Jesus and the religion that uh, sprung up um, about him. Um, most of my students, when they come into my classes, are aware um, that uh, in the contemporary world, Christianity comes in um, all kinds of uh, different versions or flavors. Uh, we talk about um, denominations usually. And um, one recent guidebook uh, estimates the number of Christian denominations in the contemporary world, it's something like 88,000. So uh, quite a bit, um, quite, a, quite a large number. Uh, what my students um, usually don't know is that this kind of diversity stretches all the way back to um, Christian origins. Um, and so this is where uh, the matrix, uh, the film um, can be useful in my classes and has been useful in scholarship on early Christianity. Because um, one of these very influential early Christian groups that kind of set itself against other forms of Christianity in the early centuries of the religion, um, created a set of beliefs that reflects in surprising ways um, the kind of worldview that the Matrix, the uh, 1990 film establishes. Um, and in this film, um, what I would say is uh, what, what calls, uh, what I would call attention to is of course the, the um, opposition between uh, ignorance and knowledge. This is the major theme of the film. And the early Christian group I'll be talking a little bit about um, uh, is known as uh, the Gnostic Christians. Um, and the term Gnostic here comes from the Greek word for knowledge. For them, the world was um, a place full of people just kind of um, wallowing in blissful ignorance, um, except for a select few. Uh, who had been given uh, salvation through knowledge of what is real and what is true. And this knowledge was delivered according to these Gnostic Christians by the figure of Jesus. So their belief system um, runs parallel to the kinds of uh, uh, dramatization that um, occurs in the matrix. And um, it offers a different path uh, for Christianity in the ancient world, a path not taken as um, most Christians, uh, as it turned out, focused um, on the figure of Jesus, his death, and what they believed um, to be his resurrection as the path for salvation. But Gnostic Christians, um, like the Matrix, seem to think that um, knowledge was the route uh, to salvation. 
So um, those are some of the topics uh, that uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Shipley and I will be exploring in our, um, in our presentation. We have uh, shifted it from in-person to a webinar. So I hope that um, for those people who are following long distance that you'll be able to um, attend. Um, and I look forward to um, all kinds of questions and observations um, about, uh, about the questions that, uh, that we raise. Thanks. Thank you both for giving us this great introduction to what I'm sure is going to be a really awesome webinar. For the rest of our time together, we'd like to take questions from you, the audience. Um, so if there's anything that you want to ask any of the panelists or Rob or I, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A um, in the little button at the bottom. So we have a question for uh, Morgan and Chris, and it's um, Matteo Manfredini wrote Religions and Spirituality, Showing the Differences in Religions, but the sim Similarities in Spirituality. Um, somebody has translated the book in English, but it hasn't been printed yet. And um, this is from Sally Noddings, and they've noted that um, they're gonna invite Dr. Manfredini to the conference. That sounds wonderful. I, I would love the opportunity to be able to, you know, hopefully speak with them. And, um, you know, as Dr. Flingos was saying, the film has so many interesting implications to it and so many applications. And um, even this idea of the red pill has almost become completely unmoored from what the film was attempting to say, that it's used in so many contexts. Um, I'm not a, 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 a social media person, I will admit that, but I, it's endlessly memed constantly. But there's something really significant, you know, specifically kind of thinking about what Dr. Falingo says and the way then it's kind of showing up within these conspiratorial movements that we are not presented with full truths, right? And therefore it's in accessing those that we also perfect ourselves as humans and gain the capability to kind of realize the world we want for ourselves and for others. Um, and at times that can be beautiful visions of togetherness and community, um, but increasingly in our current moment, it's mired in these uh, antagonistic moments. So I really appreciate you sharing that text with me. I was not familiar with it. I had a question yeah, for uh, our faculty member. Oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead, please. I was just gonna follow up uh, quickly, uh, both to what Dr. Shipley said and to the question. Um, uh, I, I should point out that, that I, I think watching the matrix from a the perspective of religious studies is a little bit of a Rorschach test. Uh, uh, Dr. Shipley might agree with this. It, um, so when I, when I watch it, I see early Christian Gnosticism, but scholars of Buddhism will say, no, for Lengish, you're wrong about that. This film is about Buddhism. So um, it's interesting to raise that question. I mean, I think it, there are a lot of um, uh, questions about the differences among religions, and there may be some shared assumptions as well. So um, I hope that we can get into that in our presentation. I'm sorry to, to uh, cut you off there, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Oh, no worries. I was just going to ask a question to our faculty members who um, volunteered their time and actually submitted proposals for this. What inspired you to do that? And um, when the call came out last spring? Well, I'll, yeah, I'll quickly just say I really, really wanted to work with Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great opportunity to do it. So that was uh, that was uh, my kind of selfish reason. But um, also um, just to be part of a kind of uh, uh, a, w a welcoming event. Um, uh, you know, uh, fingers crossed, things are are going to be uh, much different this semester than they were last semester. And I can't think of uh, a better way to kind of uh, celebrate new beginnings than than through art. So um, right. So those are my my feelings. I would echo Dr. Flingos. I mean, it was a wonderful opportunity to work with him. And, um, you know, we've been colleagues now for nine years almost, but this is our first opportunity to really do a project together. And like he says, while we have very divergent um, areas of expertise, there's also some really interesting overlaps that sometimes we don't get the opportunity to explore because the way in which, you know, we're individually doing our research or we're individually teaching our courses. And so it's just a wonderful opportunity to collaborate. Um, on, you know, on a different note, I'm somebody who in my courses relies on art a lot to try to um, draw students in, to provoke conversations, to help them think through different perspectives. And um, 
a, uh, uh, an entire week, you know, an entire kind of welcome back event dedicated to that, I think shows the, the value of the arts, um, not just as something that uh, invigorates us because of its beauty, but also something that really challenges us, right? And so based even on the two previews that I got today, I've already been making lists myself going on and being like, this sounds like a great event. This sounds like a great event. And I'm now adding all these things even to my syllabi to be like, hey, students, do you see what's happening over here? So I think like Dr. Fringo says, it's a great way to welcome people back to the university. But I think it's also a profoundly um, impactful way to show what the arts are really doing um, and the type of conversations that they're galvanizing. Stephanie, Rob, I think you both submitted something for the RFP, for the call for RFPs. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, what I submitted initially, I actually wound up changing. Um, over the summer, I was awarded a digital humanities grant to do the work on the project. I talked a little bit about synthesizing the sound of space, which eventually will feature some podcasts with um, NASA engineers, hopefully some um, synthesis, some record producers, some people who've really thought about how we use transistors and those synthesizers in exploring that sound of space. And one of the things I've really been enjoying and it's been really healing for me during the pandemic is just um, interacting with people online and like collaboratively making sounds and beats and music together or just like thinking through the ways we can do that. And so I canceled my two original um, presentations to do one that really focuses on the sound of space. So I'm excited for people to come and say, oh, I want to hear what happens when you sample um, Lake Michigan, but also maybe put like a low pass filter on it and think about what happens if we get some chimes in there too. And can we also take that clip from NASA where they put um, the sounds that they've recorded from Mars on top of that. So I'm looking forward to just like being able to interact with people and make things together. And I'm hoping that this is a chance really to get to do that with people. So that's kind of what inspired me to a initially come in and do it because initially I proposed two lectures on another project in strategic planning. And I thought this might actually be more fun for everyone if we got to interact and play and really just have a moment to breathe and make and heal and have fun. Um, the, the proposals that I submitted were really um, related to student organizations and student life in the Department of Theater. So there's a second stage playwriting group where the, they will do a six hour playwriting challenge. There are two improv teams that will be performing. There are um, uh, the dance classes taught by the student organization Orcasis. So really it was getting trying to get those student rally the students to come together to create the, these workshops for their peers. Um, and so I also, uh, I'll be in rehearsal uh, for a show during the week. So I won't be able to participate in as much as I wanted to, but there are things like um, acting workshops, scene painting workshops, all of these things through just through one department and then lots of others from art and art history, Broad Museum. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people all over the place doing stuff. Thank you, Dr. Nerula. I was wondering if you wanted to chime in. Sure, yeah. Um, I think uh, for me, my sort of motivation, you know, pretty similar to what everyone has said, but I think one big realization for me has been over the pandemic is, you know, art thrives in communities. And, and I am, you know, there's this myth of like the genius artist sitting in their basement, you know, crafting and making things. And I think in, in reality that that rarely happens, you know, I'm sure there are geniuses out here in this group, but uh, I would venture a guess their genius comes out when they're working with other people. And so for me, uh, that, that was the big motivation is to uh, uh, find collaborations across campuses. Um, you know, like um, Dr. Vasco was mentioning about just so much work uh, and opportunities between science and, and technology and art, you know, uh, with so many awesome people on this campus. Um, I think uh, that was my motivation to hopefully bring people together and just kind of get a survey of what, what everyone is doing. I think on a, an academic campus, you know, because there are so many demands on us, we tend, tend to get very siloed. And so I'm hoping, you know, that I can sort of uh, be part of that silo breaking process. Thank you. I love that. And I also see a comment here that I agree. I love what Morgan just said, and he sold me on attending. So I think that's part of our marketing strategy. We just need to get Mark, uh, Morgan out there a little bit more and all the other presenters. <laughs> uh, 
There is a question on how much of Arts Week will be able to be viewed virtually. I don't know, Rob, Stephanie, if we actually have that, that breakdown just yet. I think we're still playing get by ear in some ways too and seeing what the comfort level is, not only of the attendees, but also the presenters. And I think that what we've asked is that almost every event could have a virtual option, but some of them will be more difficult than others. And certainly the quality of that, because we're in outdoor spaces and we're in a variety of places, it might be impacted by your enjoyment of it just because of the, the actual low tech element of it. Yeah. But as we, we've just asked for those uh, Zoom links, so those will be coming up onto the website soon. Um, so they'll be coming up soon. I have a comment on here to Dr. Shipley's point regarding the importance of arts and education. I feel, oops, I feel as a um, disadvantaged K through 12 students in their development, many school districts don't have much to offer in the way of arts anymore. Um, even though I really wasn't paying attention when I was younger, going to museums, doing book reports, attending plays, music, and drawing, I think you're not alone. Um, but they do assist in the development and the ability to think critically and to dream, which is so important. And the arts really, in um, the, this alum's opinion, creates more of a civil society. Does anybody have anything to add to that? It was beautifully written and, and, and very true, yeah. Very true. And I think that's one of the reasons why we wanted to to move this event from just a weekend up in Mackinac Island, but accessible to more people too. So even if you can't get to Mackinac, you can almost always, whether it's bus or virtually, um, depending on where you're at, at least be able to interact or engage in the arts here at MSU and throughout the community. And um, that really is holding true to our mission to make sure that education is accessible to all. I see one other comment on here too, as a 1990-91 Studio Arts alum in the Department of Art, Art, History and Design and in the MSU Detroit Art Reach Admissions Office out of State Counselor. This is a wonderful showcase of what MSU has to offer. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for that comment. And I wanna say thank you to everybody here, not only on the panel today, but to also in our audience. Um, this is an exciting preview. I think that we're all ex nervously excited. Um, being at our inaugural one, we're not sure what to expect or what not to expect. So we appreciate the feedback. We appreciate the ideas. And most of all, we appreciate your support through all of this. And we hope you are able to attend, whether it's in person or whether it is virtually, or hopefully be able to catch a YouTube video on it, post the event. And please make sure you continue to follow um, the website, which, which is artslaunch, A-R-T-S-L-A-U-N-C-H dot M-S-U dot E-D-U for um, the most up-to-date and current information. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.